meeting uh, for Tuesday, March 12th, year 2002. Uh, the first item on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Something being passed on. Um, adjustments to the agenda. Seeing none, I'm going to move on to approval of the uh, February school board minutes. Well, do I have Kevin? one? I'd like the, uh, uh, the minutes to reflect my dissent. Um, nothing lengthy, but just the fact that I did dissent. On, what, on, on what the I'm topic of the uh, baseball and softball trips. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other um, adjustments to those meeting minutes? Otherwise, um, they would stand as approved. And we're going to move on to <clears throat> comments from our high school representatives. Is that David? You keep changing every month, David. I mean, you look great, but you keep changing. Month, All right. Uh, you can tell spring's coming in high school because everyone has the, their lacrosse sticks out. Um, people are starting pre optional preseason practices. Uh, softball players, baseball players, lacrosse players, runners. So um, we're all ready for spring. Um, in the spring, seniors have the STP, the senior transition projects. Um, they're starting to get underway. We're starting to turn in all of our forms. Um, we're making contacts in the places we want to go, places we want to visit. Um, also coming up is kind of a new uh, fundraising idea. A few se a senior and a junior came up with the idea. It's a PlayStation 2 video game called Madden. It's a football game. And there's going to be, they're trying to figure out a way to have a big tournament, kind of, you know, brackets and stuff. and um, that Anyone in the high school or middle school would be invited to uh, participate and in the championship, you know, final four, or whatever they're, they're going to call it. It's going to be on a big projection screen, and a lecture hall or something. So that's that's what we're looking forward to in the high school. <laughs> uh, speaking of sports, uh, there was an issue at a recent uh, it was with high school sporting event, uh, uh, a hockey game, uh, where one individual felt compelled to say something that was kind of inappropriate, um, and so the student council has taken up. Uh, um, basically kind of, you know, tap, like a, a standard of, uh, of behavior for uh, spectators at sporting events. Um, and we'll be working with uh, the faculty, coaches, uh, and any members of the community who are interested um, as far as what, you know, powers the administration has in terms of dealing with such individuals uh, who feel compelled to do such things. Um, and uh, there's actually a couple of things in this particular game. One, one of them is in question, but uh, there was def definitely one breach of tact in one situation. Um, but we'll be working uh, on that if anybody's interested. They can contact uh, me because my committee is going to be dealing with it. Um, or uh, Mr. Ely, who's chairperson of the C along at Con. Um, so, uh, also, for uh, policy changes that the SAC is looking at right now is the study hall policy. Uh, the study hall policy, as it stands now, is somewhat uh, loose. It doesn't really set any requirements on teachers for how they um, control the, uh, the kids. Uh, freshman and sophomore have a uh, place to go. Uh, you know they have a designated teacher in a room, and whatever that, however that teacher handles them, whether they make them be quiet and sit there, or whether they allow them to walk around and talk, um, it's it's up to the teacher. So some students feel that they um, that the study halls aren't the kind of environment where they can get their work done. Um, so the SACs taking it, taking it upon themselves to. Uh, uh, revise that policy so students so the study halls will be a little stricter and for the students that need that um, also uh, regarding we spoke to you last month about the uh, the uh, dentist who came to speak to us uh, regarding uh, some dangers associated with uh, soda consumption uh, we've decided to launch an informative campaign to uh, uh, stop you know students from uh, making any mistakes with soda that they may make um, and uh, you know just basically you know some informative stuff so they don't uh, you know, damage their teeth or anything like that. 
um, because he did bring up some interesting points at the meeting, and um, we just want to, you know, uh, give some consideration to the time he gave us. Um, uh, one of the last things, um, the SAC every year participates in a large community service project. Uh, right now, the SAC members are looking for a community service project that we can all participate in. You know, we do it as a group. Uh, I can't remember what we did last year, but we do something big. Okay. That's, uh, <laughs> something, something, that something memorable. That's what uh, the SAC is kind of looking forward to right now. What was the other thing? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, questions, comments? As, as usual, I can't let the SAC walk away without a comment. I, you guys are doing really, uh, the entire SAC is doing great work this year. Um, you're really putting uh, the SAC from several years ago, uh, challenging them hard on the, uh, the type of things you're doing. You've got a full plate, and I'd like you to think about adding one more thing to your plate. And this probably relates more to seniors than anything else, and that is that many of you seniors will be 18 years of age or older by the time our local elections happen. And I think over the last six months, we're beginning to learn that that's what some of the things are about, and that's why the kids whose name are on the rock uh, <coughs> are doing what they're doing, even if they don't realize it. So it might be interesting to see what kind of a voter registration drive you could get going and actually get those folks out participating in their first, first opportunity to vote. Uh, that's near and dear to my heart because it was my generation that got the 18-year-old vote um, and the opportunity for 18-year-olds to vote. So I'd hope you'd consider that. Definitely. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely talk to you see about that. That's a really good idea. Chris, just a comment in terms of uh, Dr. Ortengren's uh, uh, um, sort of uh, public education. I'm, I know he's very active in that, um, and I'm sure that he has a tremendous amount of resources if you're planning on doing some, some <coughs> education. So you might contact him again. Yeah, actually, I just sent the letter today that uh, requested if he has any information he'd like to send us regarding, you know, to include in such public service announcement kind of thing. So uh, uh, just send it to us. Uh, I, I just mailed it today, actually. Good. Okay. Yeah. One other thing. If you're um, looking for a community service uh, type of project, uh, the timing on that is appropriate. I think you might want to speak to the ladies down here with the playground committee. I, I believe they'll be looking for work, uh, workers to um, help uh, get those playgrounds ready for the opening of school uh, in the fall. Mm. And um, might not work in the timing, but it certainly would be great to have uh, the high schoolers help on that aspect. Great. Okay, good job, thanks. We'll now hear from our middle school rep representatives. Um, the fifth grade has had quite an exciting past couple of weeks. Um, last week was the newspaper week, and all the fifth graders get together and they do several activities using newspapers. And the students, as well as the teachers, believe that that was an extraordinary learning experience as well as fun and exciting for them. Also, CMP recently did their safety presentation to the fifth graders about um, wires and electricity. And the music program is at a high peak right now. Cape Elizabeth continues to have many talented middle schoolers that are accepted into the honors band and chorus program. And the concert was recently held and was a huge success. Also, a couple of weeks ago, the eighth grade band received an invitation by the legislative to go to Augusta and perform for them. And we we're all very honored and excited for that. Um, this Friday, grades close for the second trimester. And we'll be receiving our port cards soon after that. In with our grades, it'll be a course selection sheet, and for it'll be for eighth graders, and we're all very excited to experience our high school course selection process. Um, also, the fifth and eighth grades just recently finished testing. The eighth grade took the MEAs, and the fifth grade took the CATs, and hopefully the results on those are satisfying. Um, also, they were pretty long, but I think that the eighth graders and fifth graders liked the short break from school. <laughs> um, also, 
the, something that just occurred was the Wonder Years workshop that was organized by the middle, mostly by the Middle School Parents Association. Um, we spent last Friday after a week of MEAs in workshops. Um, the morning sessions were focused mainly on leadership and getting to know yourself and others better. And the afternoon session was based on just like fun activities. Um, the Wonder Years, I think, also was a good break for us after the week of testing for MEAs. And winter sports are also coming to a close. Uh, swimming, basketball, indoor track, and Nordic skiing. And the seasons have been filled with a lot of victories for the teams. And Great. Questions? Did you get a lot of uh, outside participation on the Wonder Years? I couldn't get there, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. There are like a few parents, specifically Ann Belden, who has a son in the sixth grade, was really active in organizing it. So great. Sounds like it was a good experience. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good job. We're gonna move on to communications. No, just to, to note that um, I included in the packet of communication regarding. Um, uh, the main school superintendents association and funding and that's a, that's a bit old because and that's just them taking a stand but the funding situation from the state is fluctuating on a regular basis so we won't have a real clear picture on that for i think uh for next not until next several weeks okay. george yes Jim. Uh, i'd just like to relate that i had the opportunity and the joy to attend uh, yesterday's technology steering committee meeting as did jeff and uh we we saw or I had my first exposure to the ATM uh, classroom at the high school. Uh, Gary Lenoy put on a presentation that uh, was, was awesome. It was truly awesome. We actually plugged into a, an ATM classroom down at Thornton Academy. Uh, we were scheduled, but they weren't aware that we had them on our, on our camera. And uh, while we had them plugged in, there was an announcement that came over the intercom at, and uh, it, it was asking a Mr. Trottier to come to the office, and uh, it took us a couple minutes to realize that it was Thornton Academy's intercom that we were listening to. It, it was, <laughs> uh, in one respect, it, it opened up your eyes to what is coming uh, as far as conferencing and, and distance learning. Uh, the other side is that uh, we're now aware that definitely Big Brother is watching, so. But it was, it was fun. And just for clarification, ATM is not automatic teller machine. I don't think so. Uh -huh. <laughs> Something else, but we don't know what it is. We just know it's ATM. Um, other uh, communications? Uh, comments from the public? We're going to move on. Uh, do we have recognition scheduled for this evening? No. I don't think so. We move into the superintendent's report and uh, start with an update on the future direction planning. As, as usual, just to let you know what is happening in terms of future direction planning, um, the curriculum mapping process, which is the documentation phase of our curriculum development, um, is continuing and in many regards, I think some of the teachers are almost completed with that process and our goal is to complete that documentation at the close of the school year. And that's one of our major uh, future direction plan action plans. Also, the uh, Culture Climate Committee um, has completed a survey which I would, um, which the Climate Committee and the administrators have examined the results of that. Many of the questions on this survey will serve as baseline data, and our hope is that um, two years down the road to, to uh, conduct the survey again and see how we compare uh, to where we are right now as far as the results are concerned. I'd also like, once the administrative had, have had an opportunity to share the results with their staff, um, then I would like to share those results also with the school board, but I wanted to give them the opportunity to do that, to do that first. Um, the Educational Foundation, uh, I think you've received an invitation. If you haven't, you're invited uh, to an informal evening um, at uh, Perputa, uh, just an informational session uh, with regard to the, the Education Foundation. Again, it continues to, to gain momentum, um, and this is the next step in that, in that process. Um, and before I turn it over to the Cape Play individuals that are here with us this evening, um, just one other note that we do have in uh, teacher resignation. Uh, Aneen Burgess has resigned. Um, she has been a PE instructor 
overall student advocate and a coach in our system um, and has give us, given a, this district a very much appreciated 26 years of service, but she has resigned. And with that, uh, my last item on my report, um, you've heard a lot about, and I know many of the board members have been very involved with the, the playground group, um, but just as the, they did request, just to keep you informed as to where they are in this process, uh, that it might be a good time for them to come in, in, and visit this evening and share the information about at least where they stand right now. Good evening. My name is Laura Briggs, and I'm co-chair of Cape Play, together with Lisa Silverman-Gent, who's sitting here in the audience. Um, I believe many of you are familiar with Cape Play, but just to give you a brief background on it, um, about two years ago, a playground committee was put together by the town, composed of members of the staffs from the two schools, representatives from town government, as well as various citizens, to examine our need for improvements in the town's playgrounds. After 18 months of study, um, the Playground Committee recommended in June that three different projects be worked on. Uh, improvements to the Pond Cove Playground, improvements to the Middle School Playground, and a brand new playground at uh, Fort Williams. At the time, $150,000 in bonded monies were available for those projects. It was not sufficient, and the Town Council challenged the citizens of the community to uh, try to raise funds to match that to make these projects possible. And they directed us at that time to seek sufficient funding so that we could proceed initially with Pond Cove and the middle school simultaneously. And again, we had this time constraint that the bonded town monies need to be used by the end of this year, um, or the construction season of this year, therefore the fall of 2002. Uh, and since we didn't want to have construction of the playgrounds going on during the school year, we essentially have to do the work this summer to not interfere with the schools. As a result of that, Cape Play was formed, and it's essentially the fundraising arm for playgrounds in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I'm pleased to tell you tonight that since that time, we've raised over $95,000 to match the $150,000. And you'll see that those numbers are somewhat higher than the numbers in attachment one of the report that we gave you, in part because it's been a very lucrative week for us. Uh, we had an auction last week and have raised over $20,000 from the auction. As a result, I think, of the enthusiasm and positive energy in the community, we've also had um, quite a bit of funds come in just the last day or two uh, as a result of that auction. <coughs> Um, the support from the parents in the community has been tremendous. I was looking through our numbers and trying to figure it out. Over $30,000 of that $95,000 comes directly from parents, um, either through donations from both of the parent associations, which have been tremendously supportive of this project, through fundraisers such as the School Pops program, the Hannaford Receipts programs, through um, special events that we've held, a bingo night, movie night. Um, there was a mother-daughter tea recently held. All of those events have been strongly supported by parents in the community, as well as children in the community. We've had several brands county troops helping out with different issues. Um, and my understanding is that even that the fourth graders are now considering a possible donation um, as part of their departure from Pond Cove and moving up to the middle school. We've also received a $25,000 grant, a Land and Water Conservation Fund grant, specifically for the middle school project. And um, that's a federal grant. Uh, 25,000 is the maximum you can receive for it. And we feel very lucky to have received that grant. Um, with that, I'd like to turn over the mic to Pat Carroll, who's our landscape architect. He's been working with the town for over a year and a half on the project. And Pat can share with you um, the details of the proposed playground improvements for both Pond Cove and the middle school, as well as the bidding process that we expect to pursue. And I guess I should mention that we met with the town council last night, and they did um, unanimously approve this project. My name is Pat Carroll. I'm a landscape architect with Carroll Associates in Portland. And I've had the sheer pleasure of working with this group for the past year and a half on this project. And it's been, it's been kind of slow and kind of, they, you know, it's been kind of building and building. But I think that uh, we've really got some real momentum going now and uh, the funding is in place. And uh, I think we're at a point when we can really make this thing happen. Um, I'm going to go through the Pond Cove. There, there are two playgrounds we're really talking about. One is the Pond Cove playground. The second is the uh, middle school playground. And I'll go through the Pond Cove playground first, and then we'll talk a little bit about the middle school playground. But, but basically, about 
we've been working on this thing and developed a master plan for the entire Pond Cove playground area, which extended all the way from, from up by the library all the way down to, to the new uh, fire barn. But, um, and, and initially it was broken into several different phases in order to kind of accomplish this thing over a period of time, acknowledging that the fundraising was going to take probably several years to accomplish uh, the, the total budget. <clears throat> Um, what we did about two months ago, we met with Mike McGovern and uh, several of the town staff, Bob Malley was there and so forth, and um, at that point in time, Mike directed the group to proceed with developing plans for phase one, which was uh, basically about a $240,000 budget. Um, and as um, Laura has indicated, we have a little over $240,000 now available. So the plans you see before you tonight have really been kind of worked and reworked and rehashed um, in order to, to stay within that budget. And it really represents about $120,000 worth of play equipment itself and about seventy dollars to $75,000 worth of, um, is that right? Yeah, about $75,000 worth of uh, actual site work in order to accommodate the playground equipment on the site. Pond Cove Playground, currently there's a, there's a small hard surface area here. It's kind of a quarter of a circle, if you're familiar with it. There's a tree in the middle of this. This is where kids play uh, four square and hopscotch and things like that. There's a, typically, there's a, there's a timber wall that's in pretty sad shape. Along this side, there's a series of crab apple trees that uh, kids tend to run around and climb on. Um, and then there's a, a timber playground area right in this general location right here. The, the intent of the plan is really to expand fairly significantly the amount of hard surface play area and to develop a, a very nice new kind of soft play area which consists of uh, uh, wood chips and playground structures themselves. So, the orientation here is such that you come out of the school, this is the main exit out of the school for the kids. They'll meet on this hard surface play area here. This also forms a great staging area for kids to line up and move back into the school. Um, again, it'll, it'll about double the size of the existing playground area. And then we're gonna develop a soft play area that's actually staggered in two levels just to the south side of the existing playground area itself. And the reason it's in two levels is, as you know, there's, there's uh, quite a bit of ledge in this area right through here. There's a couple of areas up on top and another one down in here right now uh, where ledge is actually exposed on the site. And I know um, Tom Eismeyer has had concerns about safety out in here with, with this exposed ledge and kids running around and so forth. So. Um, in order to minimize the amount of site work and also to kind of work with the, with the topography and work with the land, we've actually split this into a lower playground area and an upper play, playground area. The upper area will abut right adjacent to, there's an existing uh, hard surface basketball court up here. It's, it's not a regulation court, but it's a small little area where kids do play basketball and shoot some hoops and, and run around. It'll be adjacent to that and there's about a two and a half foot drop down to this lower area. The lower area will be directly accessible off the hard surface play area. The upper area will be accessible off a set of steps or this will be an accessible sidewalk that, that comes up from below. So the, the upper area will be totally accessible uh, for any handicapped type persons. Uh, as we connect this up here with the sidewalk, we're also gonna re locate the steps that currently come out over here and wind up to the, to the library. So we're gonna make that library connection a much more uh, direct route from the school directly over to the library itself. Um, we're, we're toying with the idea of um, having this upper playground area, it'll be a separate structure and uh, be, utilize that grade change so we'll actually have a slide here that'll drop down that two and a half feet down to the lower area. And that banking along here, we're gonna, the intent would be to use a rubberized surface on there at a three to one slope, so it'll be sloped back. And uh, that'll allow kids to kind of run back and forth between the upper and the lower area. So we think there'll be a really nice flow 
of play through here. Um, these structures themselves will accommodate well over 100 to 120 kids. Um, you know, hopefully this will accommodate the uh, the lines that wait all, all recess long for four square every every recess, and uh, so we think that it's really going to work out pretty nicely. This dashed in kind of hatched in area here is um, what is. I, I assume one proposal, it hasn't been finalized, but this is a proposal for an addition to Pond Cove, which uh, I'm sure that some members of the board are, are on that committee and know the status of that. But we've been in pretty close contact with uh, Bob Howe, who's the architect, and uh, this footprint represents his latest thinking on kind of where that would occur. So we, we feel confident that the playground itself uh, will we'll not really interfere with any future building expansion, that it'll, it'll really kind of recreate kind of a real active kind of play zone here that's safe. Uh, the play equipment has been selected to, from a f company called Landscape Structures, who have, uh, they've been around a very long time. They're a very high quality oriented playground company. Uh, their equipment is built to last 20, 20 to 30 years or more. So. Uh, we feel pretty confident that uh, you know what we're going to build out here is really going to last a long time and be a worthwhile investment for the community. Yeah. Is the green space to the left? And <coughs> yeah, keep coming. Here? Right there. Yeah. Right here? Yeah, is that, that whole area? This Can whole area? Play on that as well? Yeah, this area in here, I mean, right now, it's, it's just, it's not green, it's right. brown. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, but is that just going to be left open so they could play soccer yes, or whatever yes. over there? In the master plan, which um, unfortunately we don't have a copy of here, but in the master plan, this was all going to get actually regraded and leveled off because um, for the, it's, there's quite a slope to it. I think there's about 14 feet of drop across that into the playground. And so balls and kids tend to kind of roll down and collect down at the bottom of the hill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so, um, but, but I think if, if this addition goes in here, that's going to impact kind of the rest of this playground. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, one of the reasons we left this basketball court in here, initially in the master plan, basketball was going to get moved down to the far end of the site. Mm -hmm. And knowing that that may be years from now or may never happen, the thought was to go ahead and leave this in here. It's actually in pretty good shape, so uh, that's the intent. The middle school is a little more simple. Um, that's due partially to the fact that uh, we've really only got two grade levels that we're dealing with here. Fifth and sixth graders are really the only ones that I think uh, actually utilize this play equipment. Um, and the second is because it, um, it, it doesn't, we've, we've got other options for play at the middle school. But um, the intent here would be the current play structure is right in this location right here. That would be removed. There would be a new play structure that would be approximately the same size. Uh, we're, we're looking at about $45,000 worth of equipment um, for the middle school here. <laughs> These, are, these represent the new swings that were actually installed last fall. And uh, there is another swing, a tire swing, that's, uh, that will be part of this project that will be installed just to the other side of the, uh, the other swing set. Um, this project, due to budget, um, the middle school project only includes uh, the play surface, the edging, and the play equipment necessary here. All the hard surface that you see here which would be an eight-foot sidewalk and a hard surface play area for four square or whatever is not in the actual base bid for this project and that's that's really a budget consideration that we had to deal with we are intending to design this and bid it out as what we call an ad alternate to the project so that if um, if the funding is there if if the play cape play group is able to generate more funding or if the bids come in low, or we're also carrying about $20,000 in contingency within that $240,000. So if we don't need that contingency money, that can go to pay for, for some of this, and we're hopeful that it, that it will, because I think it's a, it's a pretty necessary component of play at the middle school here. I mean, currently, there's really no paved connection out to the playground. 
So those are the, those are the two uh, um, areas that we're talking about. These are just some blow-ups of the play equipment. And um, this is, again, kind of the upper playground area, Pond Cove, the lower <laughs> playground area. This, this is actual play equipment that the committee has selected in working very closely with uh, landscape structures. Um, they're pretty, they've been going over this thing for months and they are, they're so involved in kind of the different pieces of play equipment. Um, I think it's going to be a pretty exciting, pretty vibrant kind of place that, that is fully accessible. Uh, it has just a multitude of uh, play stations on it, things for everybody to do. And uh, I think, you know, the utilizing the upper and the lower area really kind of adds some real interest to this. And again, this is, this is a proposal for the middle school. It has three or four different slide components and a lot of other components. This has really been de designed more for older kids. So a lot of the components on this are really geared towards kids that are, you know, 11 and 12 years old versus, versus the younger kids here. The middle school playground will have to go to competitive bid, and that's a requirement of the grant that, that the town received. Um, and, uh, but we are intending to go sole source the town will um, contract directly with landscape structures for the playground equipment at, at Pond Cove. Um, as far as bidding goes, we're assuming we get uh, some kind of favorable response from you tonight. We did have a very strong favorable response from the council last night. We're going to proceed with putting bid documents together. The hope is to have that out on the street the first part of April and uh, get bids in and, and uh, be ready to roll the day that school closes. So we're looking at probably about four to six weeks total for construction. So if we get a good start on this at the end of June, uh, there's no question that this will be done by the, uh, by the time school starts again in September. So with that, I guess we open it up to questions. Questions? Jim. Yeah, regarding the, uh, the middle school site, is, is there a, uh, any kind of a significant safety concern regarding the baseball field uh, abutting the playground? I, I, I have seen some older kids, you know, be it seniors, little league, whatever, that have some pretty powerful kids that can have the ability to hit the ball out in that area. And I just didn't know if that ever came up in a conversation. No, we did. We have met with, um, with the coaches, and uh, their criteria was 275 feet. That's what this line is. Mm -hmm. I think they intend to do like they have done in the past, and that is put up the temporary kind of construction fencing out there. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, you know, there, there may be a slugger or two that's going to... Not me. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's a pretty long distance for a, for a middle schooler. It is. I have seen balls hit out there. Yeah. That's, that's the only reason I asked. But, yeah, that has been taken into consideration, you know. The other thing, the other reason that it's located here, we, we had some early schemes that pulled everything closer um, to, the, to the school, and there was a lot of discussion with some of the teachers, especially in, this, in the older wing here, about noise. And uh, so that's why it's kind of been pushed away as, as far as kind of logically possible. Pat, you said the um, play structures would have to go out to bid? So it the playground equipment here, yes. So it wouldn't necessarily be the same. It's not the company that is doing Pond Cove. It may not be, but it will be. We're gonna we're gonna pre-select a number of vendors to to have bid this. There, there are probably three or four um, that are all high quality, and and the other thing we have the ability to do is is establish criteria. So it's not just cost. Um, that that falls into the selection. It's it's a whole range of other things like um, you know client satisfaction, uh, vibrancy, um, safety issues, accessibility issues, number of stations, and so forth. So you know uh, there's 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 a fair amount of subjectivity to it, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it'd be nice if we end up with all the same uh, company. But you know the reality is that. They're really not visible to each other anyway, and they're <clears throat> totally separate groups of kids. And I think that uh, you know a, a different company could come in here and develop something pretty nice. Other questions? OK. 
Okay. Thanks, Pat. Sure. Were there, was there more to uh, the presentation? Just glad to be here tonight. We appreciate your having us. And we also appreciate, I'd like to mention publicly, the support that both the parent associations have given, which has been tremendous, as well as Tom Eismeyer, who's been involved with this from the beginning and has given us a lot of advice and guidance regarding the needs of the kids, particularly over at Pond Cove. Um, I believe at this point, we wanted to inform you, it would also be helpful just to have your concurrence that these locations are, um, that the school board's comfortable with these locations um, as we will be moving forward. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, thanks. Um, I think that, uh, Marie, did you have a comment or a question? Yeah, I just had a comment. Okay. I just wanted to say that, yes, the, the building committee had met with the playground committee um, several months ago, and um, it, in terms of where HKTA is um, anticipating any additions, they've considered all of that, so mm -hmm. we're fine with it. Um, I don't, I don't know necessarily that it requires a, a formal action on the part of the board, um, but I know that um, what would be helpful to you is to get a, a sort of a consensus of, of how the board is feeling about this. Um, the town has already approved it. Um, it doesn't have anything to do necessarily with us allocating school funds and so on. Um, so, so in some ways, um, uh, I, I think you're perhaps just looking for a, a blessing that can mean a lot or maybe not very much, but um, we'll see. Um, so I guess what I do is offer the opportunity to uh, board members to, uh, to just comment on what they've just seen. Maybe, um, and Marie, thanks for the input, because I know that that would have been a question in terms of the anticipated construction and changes in the, in the school um, areas. Do you want to start? Um, yeah, I think it looks wonderful, and I think it will be exciting to have these new playgrounds for both of our schools. Jennifer? Um, this isn't anything we need to vote on, right? No. no. Okay. Yeah, I think it's good. <laughs> Can you make one for big kids? <laughs> like me? Uh, I would just like to take this opportunity to, uh, to thank the play, K Play Group for uh, taking on the challenge that the town council gave you guys as far as coming up with uh, the matching funds. Uh, I know that that can be kind of daunting sometimes, especially if it's a first time uh, event for a core group of people who, to my knowledge, it's the first time they've raised that amount of money um, for one such project. Um, and um, I think it's going to be great. I'm just uh, seeing it grow over the past five or six years, this, uh, this effort. And uh, I'm glad it's just finally come to fruition. So thank you for all your hard work. Amen. I hope you'll take back to your group my personal thanks for all of your hard work. Uh, really outstanding job. And this clearly is a need versus a want. Uh, so I, again, I congratulate you for your hard work. And so far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Susan? The work is very impressive. To me, it speaks to uh, a group of people with a mission, getting together, getting organized, working with um, some political groups and, and um, different organizations, pulling them together, moving forward, perseverance. Uh, I just can't say enough. It's, it's a project really well planned, really well presented. Thank you so much. And um, if you'd like to w work on the um, Education Foundation, <laughs> when you've recovered from this, I, I see some great skills and talents that we can probably use in, um, as soon as you're ready to kind of move forward again. So thank you. Jim. Let's roll. I had a, I had a great time at the auction the other night. I, I did find out, though, that I, I thought I was bidding on the print for the Sperling Church, and in actuality, I was bidding on an oil painting of a rooster on the wall, but I didn't get either, so. <laughs> <laughs> But I had a great time. <laughs> I think um, you, the general consensus, consensus of the board is uh, job well done, and uh, it's just another example, and um, and and I, a wonderful example of um, how uh, folks can band together with a passion and a goal, and um, and pursue that uh, with a fervor, and uh, we all benefit. The community benefits. So thank you for your good work, Pat good design, it looks terrific, um, and I think uh, 
that constitutes the blessing that you were looking for and, and, and with thanks. Um, we, we'll, give you a, we'll give you a minute to kind of pull your stuff together so you don't feel like you're walking out. And, <laughs> I'll, I'll kind of make believe I'm lost at, on the agenda here. And you're welcome to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Pat. Somebody's purse. Thanks again. Um, we're now, um, uh, Nancy, I just wanted to uh, check one of the items under the superintendent's report was Anine, Anine's um, uh, resignation. And I wanted to make sure, is that something that you'll be speaking about also? Because I, I think that uh, board members may want to have an opportunity to uh, make a comment. So we'll reserve it till that time, um, or actually till this time, because it's principals, reports, and you're up first. I, I just want it duly noted that before I came up here, Sue Weatherby leaned over and reminded me that clock was not correct. Um, so to be mindful of my speaking time. Uh, one of the things I did want to mention, so thank you for that, Sue, forever teammates. It seems to be the focus has sort of come more to you this year. Um, it, it has, George. I've noticed the same thing. And, um, <laughs> my former colleague, Pete Dawson, told me not to be deterred by that. Just keep on going with what you wanted to say, not to worry about it. <laughs> I will. Um, I do have some things to say about Anine, but I'm going to leave that towards the end of my okay, report yeah. so that then your part can flow into that too. Just to let you know, um, yesterday the people from Apple Computer were in. I thought they were putting the airports in. This will not give you tremendous confidence about my depth of knowledge in technology, but it probably won't come as a great surprise. They came around and they had this rod. They kind of looked like scientific something or other, and they marked all the places for the airports. And then I thought, wow, I said to Gary this morning, Gary, that was so fast, they put those up so quickly. And he said, <clears throat> now Nancy, what they did yesterday was they marked on the wall with big blue spots where they were going to put the airports. But when they come to put the airports in, actually they'll be here with electricians and all that kind of stuff as well too. Um, but we are moving forward with the laptops. We don't still know what the legislature is going to do, but we're moving forward, so it's an exciting time. Coming and following up after um, Kate plays actually fits right into what I had chosen to talk with you about tonight, because I wanted to share with you just a couple of examples of some great ideas that parents have brought to us and really highlight our special partnership with parents in the Cape Elizabeth School community. As I mentioned in the fall, one of our concerns this year was with our drama play, and that last year we had Steve Price, particularly, and myself had received quite a deal of criticism um, about the fact that when he does the play, um, he is away from his classroom for two weeks of time, and that then the students miss out. That certainly was not our intention. We thought we had come up with a plan that would take care of that. It didn't work to all of our expectations. However, last spring, when this was pretty much the point where Steve and I were thinking, we're going to have to announce that Cape Elizabeth drama in the middle school will no longer exist, um, Hector Terraza came forward and said, you know, as a practicing physician, I'd like to volunteer my services to cover Mr. Price's classes, and I'm sure I can find colleagues that will join me. Instantly, Hector's thought made us start thinking a whole different way. Um, this fall, we wrote a letter in the parents' newsletter, I did, um, explaining that and seeing if anyone else would like to be involved. And almost immediately, two other doctors came forward and joined too. So. The, we're calling them the three fathers, not to be mis, mixed up with the three tenors, but the three fathers uh, will be covering in uh, Steve Price's classes March 28th through April 11th. A couple of those days they'll co-teach with Steve to hand the class over to the three fathers and to hand the class back to Mr. Price. But Hector Terrazer, Robert Winchell, and Bob Harrison will be covering our classes. Um, they all practice either in the field of medicine or science, and um, they're gonna be carrying forth with Steve's plans, but also being there as living, breathing examples of people who are practicing scientists. So certainly we wanna thank Hector for sharing with us an, an idea that really would continue both great classroom programming and drama opportunities. 
And the other great, wonderful idea, and the sharing of wonderful ideas, in the fall of 2000, Ann Belden came to our team leaders meeting and shared an idea for a teen conference with us. And over the past 18 months, Ann has worked with her committee, Sue Labosco, Beth Courier, Sue Yokobaskis, Joan Daly, and Pauline Doan to organize, Kevin, a total of 90 workshops with people, many of them members of our community, many of them parents, many of them not members of this community or a parent connection at all, or even a family connection to come and free of charge offer workshops for our students. Um, so from Anne's wonderful idea saying, I've done this before, it was a smaller school, but I think we could do it here, what do you think, um, to really coming to fruition. And as Lily and Rihanna shared with you, the students really had a great day. Um, and it was a wonderful day with wonder years. So in spirit of all of that too, just like to remind you, as you volunteer your time as well too, that on April 24th, um, the middle school staff will be hosting a volunteer reception to say thank you to all the many volunteers who have contributed to our school this year. It will be in our library from 2.30 to 4, and it is our humble attempt to say thank you to all of you. So hopefully some of you will be able to drop by that day. The, I, as we, before I leave the wonder years too, I also want to thank, in the spirit of being a K-12 learning community, that day Pond Cove greatly helped us out because they gave up the cafeteria for lunch, um, and they ate in their classrooms. Um, and it caused, I'm sure, a little bit of reorganization on their part, but they very willingly came forward and said that that would work for them, they would make it work, um, we would have the cafetorium, so we thank our colleagues in Pond Cove for their flexibility to make the day a success for us as well. And finally, I will end with just a comment about Aneen Burgess, who in her letter of resignation did note she had been here for 26 years um, and has contributed to the Cape Elizabeth learning community in many ways, teacher at all three school levels, I believe. In mid-January, we got together and organized a way to say goodbye to her and thank you um, to her. It was a lot of fun. Um, Aneen was a teacher, and as a teacher in a school community member just contributed in many ways, not only in her classroom, but in coaching, as an advisor, as a willing member of, of committees and doing work. Um, just a, sometimes just a great question asker. How come? What if? What about? Could we? And always there for the students. Knew all of our students. They knew her, and she was a resource that they could go to. Interestingly enough, as you can imagine, this step aside from her chosen career has been very difficult for Aneen, but she comes by every so often and visits us. And she has been working with our pit band for Peter Pan. The students thought of this. They knew Aneen was a great trumpet player and loved music. And their band, when they were first starting, they weren't quite sure, as they always think in the beginning, oh, will we be able to do this? And then one of them thought, you know, Maybe Ms. Burgess would be, like to come in and play with us. And so we contacted her, and sure enough, Anine has been in to play with the pit band. Um, we're hopeful that she'll be able to stay with us and be with us through the performances. Um, but even if she isn't able to do that, she has contributed once again greatly to just students realizing we can do this. It's a big challenge, but if we all work hard and we do our best, we can pull it off. And she has done that. Also, she was one of our presenters at our Wonder Year conference. Um, last Friday, so she was in the building um, seeing students, and the students love to see her and go up and talk with her. So it's nice to still have her in and around, um, even though she has had to make a very difficult decision to step aside. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, comments, questions? Board? Uh, a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity and the joy to attend a reception that was held for Neen over at the, the fire department, the, uh, the meeting room over there, and it was. Uh, I personally had, have had very little, if any, direct contact with Nina over the years, although my kids have had her for part of their phys ed experience. But uh, the joy that day to see her, uh, she looked great. She was sharper that day than I am on most days. And, and uh, it was just a joy to see the esteem and the, and the, the love that flowed that day and, and to feel the, the appreciation from everybody else on the tremendous job that she's given us over the years. Right. Other comments? I think it goes without saying that uh, Anine has been an outstanding teacher. Uh, 
my 12 years experience with her has been just wonderful. But I think I'll, I, I will think of any more in terms of not teaching uh, phys ed, things like that, but in terms of teaching civil rights, diversity, mm -hmm. and all of those little things that are so very important uh, at that stage in a, a young person's life. And she really, she was right there all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope we are able to find someone who will replace her in that area. Thanks, Kevin. On, on behalf of the board, certainly, you know, 26 years, uh, Anine, uh, um, I just always, uh, when I think of her, um, sort of just uh, think of her with a big smile, great passion, zest for life. Um, the questions, as you said, you know, right. well, what if we could do this and so on? And, and there was just so much energy and excitement. And uh, certainly, she'll be sorely missed by, I'm sure, her colleagues and, um, and by the students. And, and we certainly do wish her well. So. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. <clears throat> um, committee reports. I'm going to start with you. Oh, oh. <laughs> I was just see. I, I, I'm sorry that the time has. Uh, <laughs> I'll make sure you're paying attention, Anthony. <laughs> just kidding, Tom Pankov. <laughs> I just wanted to start by adding my thanks to the uh, Playground Committee for all the research and hard work they did and to the Cape Play group who made that presentation tonight. They have been very energetic, very productive, and uh, they've had the determination and the persistence to see it through. As you probably heard from the report, too, they, <coughs> they involve staff members and parents and kids all the way through. I think it's a terrific project, and I appreciate the uh, town council providing the financial incentive and the support all the way to get it done. When I think about the end of June having a new playground, it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. As the two uh, middle school students mentioned, we just completed uh, MEAs or, and we're doing some makeups this week. Um, in case you don't recall from year to year, there's always a lag between taking the test and getting the results because the, although part of the tests are machine scored, a lot of it has to be done by human beings. So we expect the fall results back in May and the results from last week back in October. Speaking of thank yous and involvement, I want to thank school board members who came and put on silly hats uh, and read their favorite Dr. Seuss books. In addition to school board members, town councilors and uh, community members came and it, it just makes a difference in our school day to be able to do that. Uh, as part of that ongoing theme to read more, we've been able to designate 15 minutes of common deer time, drop everything and read time on our early release days. So if you're going to be in the building tomorrow around 1 o'clock, bring a book and we'll find a place for you to read. Um, this is one of the things that our, our Ponco Climate Committee rightfully supports as being very positive for kid and, and uh, grown-up relationships in the school. Tom mentions that we're, mentioned that we're beginning to look at the results of this K-12 through survey. And I was surprised to see at, at Pond Cove of the um, staff who responded, 80% felt that they were recognized for good work. Uh, this is an area, I know you work really hard in doing this from month to month for teacher recognition, but I, I don't think that we can do enough in that area. But I was pleased at the response, but I think we should do more. And in that line, I wanted to mention that um, and congratulate Kelly Hassan, who is Ponco's nominee for the Maine 2003 Teacher of the Year Award. Uh, this, it takes a lot of work to get this application in, and I must say there's a certain modesty among all the teachers at all three buildings, and it's not our intent to promote rivalry among teachers, but rather, as uh, author Robert Evans suggests, that the focus on the nomination should be somebody who represents at our best, with repeated reminders that recognition is directed at individuals who exemplify an aspiration, a belief, a strength, a skill, or a quality that's shared around the school. Happily, I can report that Kelly does that, and the process justifies it. The uh, application process, which I mentioned because it's a little grueling, was supported by all the team leaders who checked with their teams. We also had a, a parent help us out and a former student. Uh, Kelly can't be with us tonight. She's actually up at a dinner in Augusta to honor the, uh, herself and the other 22 nominees. But perhaps <coughs> if she goes on and wins at the next level, she can come back here and uh, speak for herself. So congratulations to Kelly and good luck. 
That's great. Thank you, Tom. Questions, comments? All right. Thanks. And uh, we'll move on to the high school. Jeff. Trying to read my writing as I approach the lecture. Um, we also had MEAs. Uh, our actual last day was today. And our students were scheduled to begin their MEAs the last day at 7.30. I think it was about 7.26 that the lights went out. Um, so we had to do some major reshuffling of MEA schedules because some of the locate, well, the lecture hall is one of the locations and if you know the lecture hall, there are no windows. Um, so we were in utter blackness for a while. Some people think we are in utter blackness more often than we were today, but um, we did some scrambling and I do have to commend the, the students, um, all the students, not just the juniors who were taking the test, but all the students. Um, they, they stayed with it, um, and they weren't roaming the hallways. Um, they were very cooperative, and uh, I think we had a good, a good experience, as well as MEAs ever go. Um, today, this afternoon, um, I had the unique privilege to go and watch some of the three-on-three -three basketball. There's a big three-on-three -three basketball tournament that I guess is a tradition. I'm not sure how long it's been around, but I do have to say it's very, it's, it's sort of the theme of his playgrounds today. Um, one of the things that I think is true about the high school is that it's a really pr pretty pressured place. Mm -hmm. Kids feel really pushed to excel, which has some wonderful, wonderful results. Um, but you can feel it sometimes, that there's a bit of a, a, bit of a pressure cooker atmosphere. And it was a lot of fun uh, to watch the kids um, just playing games for the sake of playing games um, and just having fun. And these guys, who, play intense varsity basketball, dunking the ball and the eight-foot baskets that they have uh, at the three-on-three -three basketball tournament is really neat. Um, I think it's going on the next couple of days as well. So if anybody has any interest and perhaps any skill, if there's any opening, you can wear your shorts and uh, come on into three-on-three -three basketball. It was a fun experience. Um, students are signing up for classes, speaking of the movement to excel and the, and the desire to do as much as they possibly can. Um, and Many of our students will be signing up to take at least seven classes at any one time, which is an enormous, uh, enormous thing to expect um, any students to do. Um, I will say that the we do, preliminary anecdotal evidence is that, for those who are interested, is that there's going to be a significant sign up for Latin. Um, in fact, I'm going to be hard pressed to, to, to be able to um, staff the number of sections, I think that we may have to. I've been planning all along for two sections, and I think I'm going to try to stick to that plan. I haven't got the numbers yet, but we'll have to see how that plays out. Um, eighth grade open house was last night. There were a lot of parents in attendance, um, and overall a very, very positive response. Um, at the board workshop um, two weeks from today, I think it is, um, I'll be talking in more depth about the science changes. Um, there were a couple of questions about the science changes and a lot of positive feedback from parents about that change. Um, the One Act Festival, um, regional festival, was held this past weekend, and the Cape Elizabeth High School group turned, uh, gained first place uh, in the One Act Festival um, in all kinds of accommodations. Um, Dick Mullen has sort of kept them to himself at this point because I think he's planning something in terms of recognition that's a little bit different, unique, besides the principal um, saying things over the intercom. But we will be getting to there. Um, the students are going to be going on to the statewide competition shortly. Um, and Jazz Allstates are being held this weekend in Holton, Maine. Um, and I think I mentioned at one of the recent school board meetings uh, that there is a tendency for Arista County to be the site of all of these competitions, and that's what's happening with Jazz. And I can't remember where Dick Mullen said the, the One Act State Festival is. Caribou. Caribou. Long, Car <laughs> Caribou. I knew it was far away. I should have remembered. Thank you, Kathy. Also a long, long way away. So our students will be going there, and we think that they will do very well. I also have Pete Dawson's um, remarks from the, the March board meeting, if anybody is interested. <laughs> <laughs> Questions for Jeff? Thank you very much. Thank you. We are now really going to move on to committee reports, and we'll start with the finance subcommittee for the, from this evening. Well, we had two major events. Uh, Saturday we had our, uh, our public budget hearing on the, and we received uh, budget proposals from the all three schools as well as special education. Um, 
very interesting, um, and we uh, will be moving forward. It was decided tonight that we will continue conversations on the budget at the workshop on March 26th, following the high school science uh, faculties uh, presenting the new science curriculum at the high school, which will certainly be more interesting than what we will be doing afterwards. Um, everything else that we've done tonight was essentially housekeeping, uh, signing warrants, uh, the appropriation report. Uh, we did set a negotiation schedule for several of the uh, bargaining units in the school. Um, I believe it's secretaries, ed tech ones, ed tech twos, and ed tech threes, and uh, we're looking at uh, food service negotiations as well. Um, Essentially, that's that's it for finance. Uh, March 26th is coming. Um, I hope that if anybody's interested in what's going on with the school budget, um, they might come along and uh, give us a listen. Okay, good, thanks. Um, policy subcommittee, Jennifer. Um, the policy subcommittee met last Wednesday at 12 noon, and we sort of finalized all the policies that are in your packet for first reading. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, areas that, that we might be looking at new policies in, but most of our discussion was on the f uh, policies for first reading. Okay, and we'll be getting to those shortly. Um, Marie, uh, Building and Planning Committees. Okay. Um, the last meeting of the Building Committee was on 227. Um, following the school board workshop on 226. And the building committee discussed moving the um, building project from the summer of 2003 to the summer of 2004, as was discussed in the school board workshop the uh, night before. From all previous discussions with the town council, the school board, um, and the building committee, this appears to be the earliest that we would be able to um, start the project. The building committee broke into four subcommittees to start addressing the questions that we have been asked by community members, town council, and the school board. Um, we will have preliminary reports from each subcommittee at our next meeting. Um, the subcommittees that we formed are uh, the high school, the middle school, Pine Cove, and then a separate committee for the population projections. Uh, the only decision that has been made at this point is for the next school year, 2002-2003, and that is that the kindergarten will remain in the high school next year, um, and that we are asking for two portable classrooms to accommodate the incoming freshman class. This will add about forty thousand dollars to our budget, to the budget that we're currently working on. Um, the next building committee meeting will be at seven o'clock on Wednesday, uh, March twenty-seventh. The planning committee. Um, we had our first meeting on the on February twenty-seventh, prior to um, our budget review on Saturday, and. Um, the five-year plan that we had set uh, last year is somewhat um, halted by this year's budget in seeing that there are really uh, no new added programs. And the only types of things that we are adding is in regards to enrollment changes in our schools. So um, the committee will then meet again in June after this budget session and after we see, you know, where we are um, in the budget for next year and then start to plan or continue to plan uh, uh, five years out. And that meeting is in June. Um, do we need to worry about that now? No, probably not okay. right now. It's in June. Okay. Thank you. We're going to move on to unfinished business. Um, Consideration of a proposed high school baseball trip to Delray Beach, Florida. Um, is this you have in front of this is material that we have. You have in front of you uh, the proposal um, uh, 
Um, regarding the trip, um, <coughs> does not take any, any school time. Um, my recommendation would, do, would be to support uh, and approve the trip. Um, it's not unlike many other um, activities that, that the board has supported in the, in the past uh, with soccer teams and other, other teams that have gone on similar kinds of trips, maybe not as far, but which has not taken away from any school time at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we need a formal vote on this. Um, I'm looking for a motion. Jim? Um, could we handle them both in the same motion? Um, why don't we separate them out right. just, for, just because they're both? I would move that we approve the uh, requested uh, proposed high school baseball trip to Delray Beach, Florida. Okay, thank you. Second? Elaine, questions or comments on this trip? I stand on my remarks that I made last month. Okay, would, would you like to say more about that or? or? I, I don't think it's particularly necessary. I just think that, um, that under the circumstances that uh, some of the things that we're raising money for are extravagant. Okay, I just want people to have a sense of the flavor of it. Um, any other comments? Yeah, well, yes, Jennifer. I, I just, from that comment, I want it clear that we're not raising money for this. Right, I think this Kevin's point. concerned about the, I think what he expressed, and you can jump in, Kevin, but it, it yeah. seemed what No, you, but just what, the way he said that, right. that what we're raising money for is it's, not the school. It's not school, money. right, it's so community, community fundraising, basically. That, right, and uh, I would remind everyone that I did include that in my remarks last month, that uh, this has nothing to do at all with school money. Right. Other comments? Thanks for clarifying that. Um, seeing none, all those in favor? We have um, six in favor, opposed, one opposed. Um, we'll move on to uh, the second piece of unfinished business, consideration of a proposed high school softball trip to Orlando, Florida. Jim? I would move that we approve the proposed high school softball trip to Orlando, Florida. Okay, um, a second. Marie, thank you. Comments or questions with regard to the softball trip? <clears throat> Ditto. I would like to take one opportunity to point something out that I will not, I am not holding against the, uh, the two groups, or oh, actually it will be three groups that are coming forward tonight. But basically we're being asked to approve a fait accompli and I'm not quite clear why we're acting on this at all um, since these trips were in fact put to bed last month before they ever came to us and these trips would have happened with or without a vote on our part. So, and since they don't take up any school time, I just. Right. I think that the way we've handled them in the past is that we've had a, an initial presentation, gotten, got, had a sense from the board in terms of proceeding, but wanted to take one more look, see at the sort of the, the final details before uh, I, ag I agree, George. The, what I'm pointing out is usually a group comes to us well ahead of time before they finalize any plans to tell us what they would like to do. Uh, but I've noticed uh, in the three situations tonight that they're basically fait accomplis, and I think that that is a failure of communication uh, somewhere to let these folks know that this, that, you know, this should be coming to us if it is going to come to us before the plans are made, finalized, and paid for. Um, just to comment on that, Kevin, the, in both the softball and the baseball, they were told probably six months ago by the athletic director that they needed board approval. Now, what, they weren't ready to come to the board, but they were told and it was communicated <clears throat> that they needed to come and receive board approval. They chose not to do that. Well, then again, I go back to now. If you did to... vote, if you did vote at this point not, to not approve, then they wouldn't go, and they lose they lose the money, whatever they put down. Well, Kevin, I, you know, I, Kevin probably I, brings my, up a good my point. My point is, is, you know, and it's got nothing to do with the specific groups coming before us tonight. But if we are going to have a process of looking at uh, trips that really don't involve school time, uh, that school personnel involved are not being paid to do. Um, you know, I don't have a huge objection to that. I just question, why, you know, the, the rationale behind coming to, coming to us with a fait accompli. 
it's uh, sort of like being told, listen, guys, we're doing this regardless of what you say, and we just would like you to bless it. Um, and again, it's got nothing to do with the groups that are involved right now. I'm saying this on a global basis. I, you know, um, I'd like to have, whether it's a co-curricular group or a, uh, an athletic group or any other group that wants to go on a trip, be it Europe, be it uh, anything, um, to give us the courtesy of saying we would like to move forward with these plans rather than come to us after everything is done. Okay. Um, other comments? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor? S six uh, opposed? One? Um, we'll move on now to new business. Consideration of the superintendent's recommendations to athletic fee positions for the spring 2002. And you have the list um, in your packet. The only one I would mention, the, the majority are uh, returning high school and middle school coaches. But I would like to mention uh, that there is a new nomination um, at um, the middle school, and that's Rebecca Sawyer for an eighth grade softball. <clears throat> okay. Now, I've got a question that you've got two eighth grade softball, so is there, that an assistant? I think they're working together and they're splitting the fee. Oh, okay. Okay, um, I need a motion on the uh, recommendations from the super, the nominations from the superintendent. Jim. I would move that we approve the superintendent's recommendations to the athletic fee positions for the spring 2002 season. Good, thanks. Um, second, Susan. Uh, questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Seven, seven, zero. We're gonna move on to uh, recommendations or nominations on co-curricular for two, uh, spring 2002. Uh, you have in front of you a recommendation for Sarah Collins as the art club uh, advisor at the high school. Okay, I need a motion. Looking to the left here, Kevin. I move that we accept the superintendent's <coughs> nomination for uh, Sarah Collins. Um, second, Susan. Uh, questions, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Seven zero. We're gonna move on to uh, consideration proposed high school economics class trip to New York City. As you recall, this trip uh, took place last year. Um, when the teacher did speak to me about, about the timing of this trip, um, I think last year it was something that took place later in the spring, but I think the dates that were available as he looked into it um, was, it was much closer than he had originally, originally thought. Um, I think last year also we had a group of the students come back to the board um, and uh, talk a little bit about their <coughs> report on their trip. And if I remember correctly, it was a, a great experience, and they were able to really have um, some real, an inside look uh, at the stock market and really relates to what that particular curriculum uh, is for that program. The problem with this is because of the timing, um, they are looking for approval. So I agree with you, Kevin, in this, in this case especially. Um, usually, we usually like to have trips like this come for an explanation and then a vote at the next meeting. Okay, um, this one is a, a little bit different though in terms of um, the responsibility that the board has. Because mm -hmm. um, they are missing school time. Because they are, it's, uh, it's basically alternative uh, education time um, in this field trip. Uh, what I need is a motion. Kevin? I'll move that we accept in this, on this occasion the uh, request for a field trip um, an economics field trip for Ted Jordan's class. And Ted wasn't able to, to be here, but uh, Jeff is, is prepared to, to speak to any questions you might have. Okay, um, I need a second on that motion. Um, Marie, questions or comments? Uh, oh. John? Go ahead, John. Um, unless I just am brain dead, which could be true, it doesn't say who's going on this trip besides Students. It's the honors economics. Am I missing that? Honors economics class. No, I meant for adults. Oh, sorry. There are, <clears throat> there are. I don't know the specific names. Oh. There, Ted has arranged for a number of parents uh, to go down of the students who are involved in the trip. Okay. 
and Ted. And Ted, of yeah. course. Yeah. Uh, so, go ahead. Go. Uh, aside from Ted himself, this is being funded by the students or their parents? That's correct. Okay, and I would, I would only just as, you know, in a sense of fair play, re, re, refer back to my remarks about getting these things to us on time. Uh, in the future, I think we need to communicate a little better with, and I don't know where that communication starts and ends, but letting everybody know, because clearly now we've got, you know, we've got one that's strictly educational, we've got another one that's athletic in nature. Uh, you know, I don't want to, I hate to be sitting here next year, uh, beating up somebody over a foreign exchange trip at the last minute. Uh, what I've done is I've already put in my notes, Kevin, that at the <clears throat> next faculty meeting, I think there's, there's, most of the faculty are not aware of the one month delay typically of what happens, and uh, I'll do a Which little Which is something that's relatively new. Right. Yeah. The, we just, that's something we started doing within the last year or so. I think stuff used to come to the, information used to come to the board, and the board used to act at the meeting more often than not. And what we've tried to do is put a one month delay into that process. So I will talk with the faculty about that um, so that they're familiar with I'm, it. Again, I'm not sure where no, it I comes understand. from, you know, and I'm not trying to pick on any group, but I understand. It, you know, if we are going to go through this process, I, I'd like some time. Uh, who's, how are they getting there? Are, are adults driving? Adults are driving. Cars. So. Okay. I guess what this points to, in addition to the month, one month delay, and maybe the burden is on us, to maybe get together a form or something that's quick and easy for them to fill out that provides us with the necessary information. For example, if a parent is driving a group of kids in his or her car, or we think a parent is, but in fact we find out that a student is, and something happens you know, who's accountable at that point, and was, was there not a teacher kind of keeping an eye on the situation? And I, I, this feels different to me from the athletic request we've received. But for that reason, what it points to me is if we have just kind of a form, number one, to save teachers and other people time completing paperwork that maybe we don't need, but to give us the quick and dirty information that we do need up front. And, and, and again, I think maybe the burden lies on us to, to be able to ask for that information in the form that we need it and also at the same time spell out um, our own timing expectations. So I'm thinking that maybe we need to go back and kind of look at that and put something together. So we're getting apples consistently, not apples one time, oranges the next. That would be a help at our end. I'm sure and the teachers would appreciate that. Um, just, just so you know, the, I mean, we have permission forms where it's very plainly spelled out with by the parents that they understand who's driving and, and that sort of arrangement. So I think in terms of that, we're covered, but it would be definitely beneficial to have a uniform form. Right. Great. Thank you. By the way, would you take a message to Ted? He was supposed to bring back New York bagels, lox, and cream cheese to me last <laughs> year. He failed to do th so. He might still have and those. And <laughs> my, my vote next year will be predicated on whether or not he remembers this year. He's got a long memory. I uh, Zay, bars, <laughs> Zay bars would be the preferred vendor. I'll have to get some spelling after the meeting. Um, the, other, the other invitation uh, to Ted was would be to come back and report out on this trip. I'm sure he'd be delighted to do that. Um, believe it or not, we are in the middle of a vote still, and um, so the one thing that I'm looking for now is all those in favor. 7-0. Everybody thought I forgot I was. I would have reminded you. Pardon me? I would have reminded you. I know. <laughs> Um, we're going to move on. Uh, consideration of sabbatical leave request for 2002-2003. You have in front of you a request from uh, Sarah Carroll regarding maternity. No, maternity. It's, it's not. Oh, oh, sabbatical leave. I'm sorry. I'm skipping down. Um, I turn but you can do the. No, I'll go right ahead. <laughs> turn that over to Susan. Okay. Um, I think I passed out a packet of information. Did everyone? No. Get it, George? Did you? Sorry, George. I don't. Did Did you all get it down the sun? Um, yeah. And because I didn't give advance notice on this, I'll, I'll just kind of quickly go over it. Take just a minute or two now to introduce it. Um, first of all, I had the privilege and honor to have met with three outstanding, competent teachers recently. Tom and I sat down. Um, with each of their administrators, and I cannot say enough about the quality of the teachers, the, the relationship that it sounds as though these teachers have with their students and the relationship that these teachers have with their respective administrators. 
um, I just left that feeling with a great deal of hope for the future of our schools and thinking that so far somebody's done something right as far as um, hiring and attracting, hiring and retaining the best out there because these, these three are very impressive individuals in my opinion. Um, I'll begin with um, Susan Dana has been in the district for 10 years, currently a Spanish teacher at the middle school. Seems to be uh, very aware of the fact that students learn foreign language in situations where the topic is relevant and interesting to them. Fashion, pop music. For some reason, um, kids really move forward learning new skills and language. And so she is looking forward to kind of expanding her knowledge and her lesson plans with that in mind. Her project will include, first of all, travel to Spain and or Mexico, which she's um, looking forward to as far as speaking uh, with people natives in Spanish. I, I guess she doesn't get a, a lot of opportunity to do that here in Maine. Um, she also expects to do an internship at a Spanish or Mexican school to learn more about their school systems, their students, their methods of teaching. Um, she's also looking into taking a college course uh, to improve her skills. Um, and her one passion is to find culturally authentic materials and she shared with us, for example, a Spanish deck of cards and their face cards are very different from, I, I guess ours must have come from the English or Anglo culture and the Spanish face cards are very different and, uh, and it helps the kids learn numbers and so forth. Um, so that was one of, the, one of the things she shared with us. So she hopes to collect a number of these authentic um, teaching materials to bring back with her and again share with other teachers in the system. Um, the next uh, teacher that we met with was uh, Richard Rothelsberger. He's been in the district for seven years, currently teaching art um, or in the art department at the high school. And the focus of his sabbatical will, will consist of three components. One is um, he expects to do work, coursework in the use and application of Adobe Photoshop software. And I'm not sure exactly what this is, but somehow it, it um, brings the world of photography into today's world as far as manipulating photographs with um, some sort of software application. And he said in order for our kids to leave here prepared in the discipline of photography, they really need to be exposed to this kind of um, experience. And so he's hoping to, to learn more about that and bring that back and eventually incorporate it into the curriculum. He also expects to um, spend time developing uh, his work in his own medium, which is black and white photography. And I think um, most of us realize that people who are in the profession of teaching in, in fine arts, who have a craft, really need to spend time developing that craft as part of the quality of what they can bring back to their students. And he expects to do that while he's away from the classroom. Um, he also is hoping to spend five weeks living and studying in Florence, Italy. With that, he expects to um, do some coursework in language and photography and at the same time collect information um, in the area of art history that he can bring back and eventually uh, again work into what is now a studio-based curriculum that we have at the high school. He thinks he would like to see and he thinks it would bring value to the students to have um, an art history component to that as well. Uh, and the third was Andrew Strout, and we know Andy, he's apparently been in the district in some capacity for 24 years. Uh, and again, we approved his sabbatical leave last year. He chose not to take it due to a colleague's long-term medical leave. He knew that it would um, maybe disrupt the curriculum at the middle school, and um, I give him credit for having put the physical education program and the students' needs before his own personal and professional development. Um, so, so I think we need to take that into consideration as we look at his request this year. Um, the focus of his sabbatical will be developing his knowledge and skills as they relate to athletic administration. His particular area of interest, and I would say passion, is looking at athletic leadership programs, which seem to be coming more and more prevalent in high schools, colleges, and professional organizations across the country. He's already begun research in this. Um, even though he wasn't given the time away last year, he actually on his own has begun to research in this area. And um, the research that he will continue doing will um, consist uh, to a great deal of 
Um, a lot of it will be done in the form of surveys. He hopes to survey coaches around their philosophy, the roles of captains, what's expected of leaders, um, and, and the qualities we look for in leaders in the athletic programs. Um, also, he would um, interview athletic administrators around areas of philosophy, coaches' roles. He hopes to interview students, parents, athletes, and other district administrators around climate, culture, and pride in athletics. Um, some of the specific deliverables that he's expecting to be working on and eventually have available for use in the district are an orientation program for incoming freshman athletes. Um, and he's also going to put some work into, I'm not sure how far he'll go with this, but work on handbooks for coaches and booster clubs, which we've decided um, we could really use. I think in addition to the work specifically in athletics, um, a lot of the leadership skills, um, the things that he'll be looking at for student athletes and captains' roles might also be able to be transferred into a more overall curriculum um, in the middle school and eventually be available to each and every student in some form or other. Um, and that's it. I, I just, um, again, I just want to say that I really think that honoring these sabbaticals um, speaks to our willingness to support, you know, a number of the things that we've really um, decided we want to back and, you know, future directions and attracting and retraining the best and possible teachers that we possibly can, the, the um, concept of continuous improvement, um, that learning is a lifelong endeavor and that um, teachers who model that will teach their students by example. And I, I just stand behind these 100%. Okay, then would you like to present the motion? Oh, I don't, <laughs> okay, I might need help. <laughs> um, I move that we, I, I, well, I was hoping you would. <laughs> we, we put you next to Jim so that you would That's know right, how to do this quickly. Me. Yeah, um, I, I recommend that we accept the sabbatical committee's uh, recommendations for sabbatical, for these th three sabbatical leaves during school year 2002-2003. Okay. Second. Second from Jim. Questions or comments? I just think this is outstanding. Um, these are really good. Um, so my compliments to the teachers as well as to the committee for bringing them forward. Um, and if anybody's interested in, in art, I, I'd suggest an occasional trip into the high school lobby as well as the middle school to see, but uh, you'll get a good opportunity to see what Richard's uh, students um, are able to do. And if you really want to have some fun, you sneak down past the cafeteria and sneak into Richard's studio down there, and uh, I think you'll all be very impressed. Um, and the only other thing, well, that I'm interested in is not only the report back that we'll be getting when these sabbaticals are over, but I'm really interested in following the process of how the information these teachers come back with is shared with their peers and shared across different school, school uh, boundaries. Um, you know, I think it's probably particularly appropriate with the language uh, type of thing. I know we had a teacher who went to uh, Spain last year, I think it was, in the high school, and how that, you know, some of that information might have been conveyed down to the Spanish teachers in the, uh, the middle school. So I have a high degree of interest in that process. Other comments or questions? I think we have, I mean, we've, we've seen some real exciting uh, projects and uh, we've heard report outs from very uh, excited and passionate staff who come back um, all excited and all different kinds of things, whether it's marine biology or foreign language or um, art or whatever it might be. So these certainly are of the caliber that I think that we, um, we get very excited about um, approving and, and uh, look forward to hearing about the adventures. Um, with all of that said, all those in favor? We have 7-0. Um, we also have a request for a, uh, one of our staff members of our teachers for a, an unpaid leave for 2002-2003. I would recommend approval of a, an unpaid maternity leave uh, for Sarah Carroll, 2002-2003. Um, 
I need a motion on that. Yes, Kevin. I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation for a sabbat uh, not a sabbatical, an unpaid leave of absence. Okay. Um, a second, Susan. Um, questions or comments? Certainly congratulations to the Carols. Um, all those in favor? <laughs> Seven zero. This is a long school board meeting. I'm not used to these. Um, Sorry, 25 after 8. Pardon me? Yeah. It's, yeah, I, I, I know it's not that time, Mary. Quit your beefing and run the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Quit your beefing and run the meeting. <laughs> All right. We shall move on to policies, and we're going to move this over uh, back to Jen. You might just give us a quick uh, review of what the t titles are of these policies and how they came to be, um, if you could do that. <clears throat> I could do that, but Tom's actually going to do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Tom? And there are numbers, so... Yeah. Um, this, most of these policies are a result of the work of the Athletic Task Force that was created. Um, that group spent um, a number of hours, either as a whole group or in subcommittee work, in creating these policies. So because uh, athletics um, is, is something that is so visible in the schools, the plan at this point is to briefly just go through them with you. Um, what the intent of the individual policy is, give you time over the next month to, to review them, um, any questions you might have, and then at the next meeting we would like to even have a short presentation that we were going to do tonight, and then it might take a little bit longer with these policies because um, we do want to invite all the comments that you do have because it is something that at times can be a bit controversial. Um, the first, and, I, and I'll, they're not in the order, I, the order I'm going to use is not the order that are in your packet, but the, the order that makes sense and how they were created. So the first policy is that with, that has to do with philosophy and beliefs, and that's file JJI. Um, the committee felt that it was important, and I think this was the group that Jim Rowe uh, headed up, uh, and, that's, and that uh, of the task force, that we really looked at what our philosophy was as a school district regarding athletics. I think something that they did quite nicely was follow a format that we've been using in our planning, that creating a philosophy and then a, a, a set of 10 belief statements um, that we can follow as a school district. And that kind of lays the groundwork for the rest of the policies that follow. The next policy is JJJR, which actually are the regulations and guidelines that you are familiar with, but there have been some changes. I'll give you a minute to pull those out. Just um, while, you're, while you're pulling those out, th um, this is a first reading which constitutes, I mean, we should have already read these, and if we have issues or concerns, this is the time to kind of address them. I just didn't want them yep. to. Yep. Um, the athletic rules and regulations were reviewed um, the underlying portions are changes in what um, uh, were in the policy that was in the policy handbook. Some of the changes were changes that were made but never were included in um, the, policy, the policy book but were maybe practices that were changed at the school. The most significant would be in the substance abuse policy. Our present policy regarding substance abuse um, for a first offense is a two-game suspension. Uh, a second offense, uh, an athlete would be suspended for the season and a third offense for the remainder of, that, of the school year. Um, this policy um, attempts to uh, bring parents into the mix um, in looking at the only way it would be the two countable con contests would be that if it was a self-referral or a parent referral. Otherwise, the first offense would be a suspension from the team for the rest of that season. Uh, the second offense, rather than a third, would be that they would be, the student would be off all teams for the remainder of that school year. So it's a, it's a bit more stringent than the, the prior policy. Um, a lot of discussion about this particular policy and the change in that. and. Um, any questions you might have about that, we can stop now. Are there questions? I, I just have some concerns having 
actually been a parent trying to interpret this policy last year, and, and those concerns still exist for me. Is when we sign this policy, when a parent signs a policy, is the parent saying, I will support you and I will report that my child has used alcohol at any point during the school year and will in fact accept the consequences even though it's between a season. I mean, I think if our intent is to clarify the role and responsibility of parents, it was a gray area last year and it to me looks like it's still a gray area. And, and I think we want parents to begin to accept responsibility here. We've got to, I think, even make it clear what we hope they will do in their relationship with the administration at the high school and the athletic department in keeping our kids sober. So, and, and I'm not sure if we need to, I don't think this is the time or place to wordsmith it, but I really think if our objective is to spell out clearly for parents what we expect of them before they sign this, so that two months later when it comes up, they, they have to go back and look at it and say, well, I'm, I'm not sure, I didn't know it meant that. I think we need to help them. Comments from Jim or Jen? What? I know some of the administrators are involved with this also. I mean, that, that, that is something that came up, and I know Jen had a, a concern about how do you enforce something like this. Um, well, I, I think, to some extent, Susan's right. I mean, if we even had some kind of line in here that instead of, it, I mean, it just says that they've read that, read it and understand the rules, but it doesn't really say. That you'll assist in it. Well. No, and is it, do we want to ask them to do that? Because we stand up and say, you know, weekends is parents. We're not, our coaches are not going to be out there looking to break up parties and, and take names down. Mm -hmm. We're looking to the parents to do that, and we get upset that parents don't accept the role, and yet we really don't ever put it out there that this is what they agreed to when they signed, their, you know, Johnny up in the fall, mm -hmm. number one. And I think substance use is prohibited throughout the school year and not just through a sports season. I, I make it clearer. If, you know, if, if it's March and your kid plays baseball and, and he's involved in drinking or she's involved in softball, it's going to carry over to the next season. I think we're still leaving opportunities for parents to, you know, kind of second guess it. And, and I don't like the role modeling it that's doing for the kids either because then the kids learn to second guess this and other policies. You know, if we really, I think we need to figure out what we want from parents. I think we need to let them know what we want from them. And when they sign up in the beginning, there should not be any question because down the road it will be questioned. George, mm -hmm. um, I'm finding myself in agreement with Sue. It's it's a point that escaped me in the past. Um, and it escapes me primarily because I've always viewed this athletic rules and regulations in any form as being very black and white and clear and have always supported it as a parent. Uh, um, but you do make an excellent point. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of too many situations where parents flat out lie on behalf of their children and or threaten litigation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, 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 and since you've brought it up, I think it's an important consideration uh, to put in here. Not just that, well, we read it, because you're right. What this signature uh, means is they understand the rules. Right. It doesn't, doesn't say they support them, agree with them, or anything else. And, uh, or that they'll abide by them. Yeah, and since we're, <laughs> we're, since we're saying in a separate policy that uh, although we support sports, it's a privilege, mm -hmm. uh, that should be the case. I, 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 yeah. is, it, is there a different contract that's actually signed by the athlete, or is this a, it seems to me that there was something different that was signed. This is, I mean, this is a, this is an administrative guideline, which is presumably attached um, and reference, re references some policy, uh, a policy it looks, statement. It's essentially the same, it just is presented differently. And does it, d does it, does it, um, does it obligate the athlete any differently than just understanding the rules and the consequences? No, I think it's an mm -hmm. acknowledgement that you understand the rules and consequences. Hmm. Right. 
But the problem, I think what we want to get at is that they will abide by the rules and the consequences, not just that they That's understand what, them. Yeah, my, my sense was that there is a contract that basically obligates, um, in the true sense of a contract, the athlete to abide by, as you say, is to abide by the rules and not just to know what the consequences are in the event that I get caught. Do you know, Jeff? Um, I have a vague recollection you might be right, and there might be a slight, I'm not sure about this, and I know that Keith will be at the next meeting to, ask, to answer those kind of specific questions. I, there may be slightly different contracts from sport to sport, and that's one of the things that we've talked well, about. Well, one of the problems we've had is that uh, there is a loophole, or there has been, where um, coaches can create their own rules for their sport, what we're attempting to do is, is to have one set of rules for all sports and not to have I think that, I think what, I mean, what we have to do is we, the, the rules are established. Coaches can, can, uh, can institute guidelines, other guidelines about practice and this and that and mm -hmm. those, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But this is, you know, this, is, this specifically um, has to do with sort of the interscholastic inter competition and, and the requirements and the uh, sort of the integrity of that. Um, I wonder, um, there was a couple of things that bothered me about this. One was that was sort of me questioning, is this, is this the thing that the kids sign? And I don't think that it is. Um, and uh, secondly, um, I, you know, I have to tell you, you know, I, I'm the parent of an athlete. I can't remember signing this um, before. I can remember attending Keith's um, par you know, parent, parent of athletes, kind of uh, breakfast presentation or whatever, and I don't know if we sign things there, but we certainly get all of the rules and the regulations and blah blah blah. And the, and you have to be there in order for your kid to play sports. So I remember that part, and and that sort of obligation. And my sense was that the kid, the athlete, actually signs a contract. <coughs> so I'm, I'm kind of confused about where this really fits into it. The other thing since we're looking at it, is, um, is that it's a, it just kind of throws in this policy extends to all students involved in extracurricular activities, but yet it, you would never know that until you get the, till the very end here. And if that's the case, then, then somehow these same, then, then why is it called athletic rules and regulations? Right, and I think that, that is, is a leftover. Mm -hmm. um, that statement probably should have been taken out because okay. this committee um, felt that Right now, it was, a, it was a huge task to take on the athletic piece of this, and that um, to include extracurricular at this point in time would just be an awful lot to do. Okay. So I think that particular sentence, I think there was an attempt, there were a lot of references to other co-curricular activities, and we eliminated an awful lot of those. Okay. I think that one doesn't, doesn't fit. Right? But it seems to me, I mean, um, it, it, it's good, good, obviously good quality work that's reflected all in here, but this is one that um, it is a, it's a little bit of a twist because it's a it, it's a potential sort of con parent contract and it's really if it's really it's this actually isn't a contract and I'm not trying to talk legalese here because I can't because that's not my background but but this is more an acknowledgement of I understand the rules and I know what the consequences are my sense was that there's actually a con an obligating mm -hmm. contract that 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 we can present to any athlete who said and so am I right am I on the right track here. Um, you are, George. The part of the problem, I think, was um, that this existed in some form. And on a separate sheet of paper, there was a contract. But this piece of paper and the contract were inconsistent, mm -hmm. uh, among other things, in some of their definitions and some of their um, consequences. And my, my best recollection was the contract was shot full of holes. My second recollection is that every September-ish, uh, the athletic department uh, would have a meeting, yeah. except that I attended those meetings four years running and was told I didn't have to be there because my kids did not participate in a fall sport. And I never had to go back for the same meeting for a winter, spring, or summer sport. So I just kind of didn't get it. I also, uh, there were years where I flat out refused to sign the contract because I felt it was bogus and my son continued to play. Mm -hmm. 
So those are some of the things that, that I have brought to the attention of the board in the past, um, back when I had the policy committee and we were struggling with some of these same issues. So, I mean, if, uh, it seems to me that if we want an obligating contract, basically all we have to do is reprint this and call it an obligating contract and, uh, you know, wh whatever legally has to be done. But I, I, I think it's, it's important because nobody takes, at least in my experience, many people did not take this thing seriously. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been in the high school decorating um, lockers when people were going to uh, state championships and overheard parents talking about, well, my kid drinks, well, so does my kid drinks, what are you going to do, you can't do anything about it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, that's, it, at home, that's fine. But in association with a school sport, it's not fine. I mean, you know, uh, it, so, I, you know, I don't know what the answer is. But clearly, if we want to convey to our students that, and their parents, right. that we're serious, then that's what we need to do. And that's why I think Sue's, you know, I, I don't, I wouldn't even attempt to wordsmith it myself, and now is not the time, but I, right. it, the point is well taken. Right, and, and I think um, this addresses kind of the carryover to the next season and throughout the school year where maybe a sport-by-sport -sport contract doesn't necessarily. I think if, even if you do sign a contract during a sport, it doesn't say, however, two weeks after this contract is complete, you're still under school policy to not consume alcohol or drugs if you're going to play another sport this year. So, so it sounds like we're almost operating on two levels, and we need to address both, I think, what, and, and decide what we want. One, one of the things, and, and Jim will give you a chance to comment too, and, and Jen, because I think you were involved in kind of uh, um, putting the, these together. But one, of the, one of the things, it seems to me, is um, there's a policy that has athletic rules and regulations. That, that sort of stands on its own. People need to be aware that there's one, and if they want to know the rules and regulations, they can, they can find that. There's also kind of a, a, a maybe a player's or an athletic, ath, athlete's uh, code of conduct, which has to do with you know, some things that they control and that they specifically agree to, to, to certain parameters. You know, some of this talks about you can't play two, two sports in the same season and blah, blah, blah. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I, maybe maybe yeah. some of it could be separated out. Which, and one is, yeah. you know, and it's, a, and, it's, and it's more a code of, of conduct or a, or a consent to, to conduct, a standard of conduct or whatever it is, that both the parents and the kids could, can sign. The other, and, and not try to, maybe it's tr we're trying to serve two purposes with the same tool, and maybe they need to be broken out just a bit. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, no, good it's point, just a George. sense. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Jim, any comments? No, I agree. And, and uh, you know, regarding conduct, I think uh, it's not just the players either. Uh, as we heard tonight, and I was a witness of that, the, the, I was embarrassed uh, at our last hockey game, and I, th I felt our administrators acted very appropriately and have followed through. Uh, but I think it's, it, it's a school-wide thing. It's a climate issue. Uh, uh. See, I'll, I'll, and, you know, as I look down and I, I remind myself of some of this other stuff, some of it is the, the principles, you know, rules in terms of the Principles Association for Interscholastic, I mean, the, the age business and all this other stuff. It's rules, rules and regulations kind of stuff. Right. And then, then there's sort of, I mean, you can't control whether you're 16 or, or, or 21. But you can control whether you drink, whether you show good sportsmanship, whether you attempt to, to cheat or whatever, I, you know, whatever those, those sort of more the ethical kind of code of, of, of conduct. So maybe, um, and perhaps we could get one of the, the things that the kids do sign so that we have that as a reference and, and then maybe um, clean this up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Can we move on from this one? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Tom. File JJI. Um, R is what you, is just a uh, flow chart that is the chain of command that was part of, for many of you that were here, or some of you that were here when the last athletic 
<coughs> group met. This was something that was taken from that group yeah. um, where that chain of command is. Um, it also has on its second page what the different levels of competition in those definitions, what used to be the pyramid to success. Um, the group felt that all we needed were the, definition, the definitions rather than success being always the high school varsity level. Mm -hmm. um, but we did need a, a definition so that parents and students would be able to see just what those levels meant. Uh, and I, have, I do have a question on the flow chart. It, it kind of makes sense to me as information flows and policies flow downward. <coughs> if a parent has a question about a middle school coach, is that parent really supposed to contact? Uh, if you have a question about a seventh grade basketball coach, do you really call the high school varsity coach with that? Way, and we had, the discussion was just about how those evaluations, and we'll see in the evaluation policies, um, that the way we would like to see that is flow through the head. Okay. Right. I'm not saying that's how it happens. Now. Right, right, but that's the plan. But we have a policy already in place as relates to faculty, and talk speaks to trying to resolve issues at the lowest possible level and then working your way up, and that seems perfectly logical to me uh, to superimpose onto this. Um, you know, it just, just may be a question, it may be something else. Um, you know, and I, I, I really do think that we ought to attempt, you know, the same way we did with the faculty, instead of people instantly picking up the phone and calling you or a school board member to complain about something, uh, that it should follow that same sort of chain of command. Um, nobody says they have to be satisfied with the lowest level coach, but that's where the communication should begin. And that's what I think that's really what it's speaking to here in, ter in terms of the intent should be to handle conflict concerns at the source uh, or the lowest possible level. So they're, they're, I mean, in some ways that's what they're directing. But you're right, there is there's certainly a parallel in terms of resolving any of the issues. I have a quick question about the middle school uh, on the second page. Um, what does it mean when you say that um, all athletes are entitled to play according to team guidelines? Well, in some cases, you're, you're limited in how many individuals uh, on a team. Um, you know, in other words, that everyone's entitled to play, but the league might say how many can, can play at the same time or how many you're allowed to have, um, and there might just be guidelines on that team. You will play, but if there are guidelines, we have to, you will play within those guidelines of that team. But you, you still state that there's a no-cut policy with a maximum number per team, and mm -hmm. if, say, for example, you have more middle school students that want to play, then can be accommodated on one team, is there an obligation on our part to provide that opportunity for all students to play on a second or third team? We've been able to do that. Uh, we've created more teams. We've been so this is a continuation of that philosophy. What we've been able to do, right? I, I think to the extent that um, I'm guessing that this is um, probably Scott Levy and John Casey actually worked on these committees as middle school representatives, but um, in some of the ways that we've done that, like in <coughs> soccer, we ran three boys teams and part of the team guideline was so many people got to go to the two games and they would rotate how many people went. Um, that wasn't a league requirement, that was a guideline we used instead of having an expansion team, which was hard to fit games in for and other schools to have a game there, but that we would always send two teams, but we ran three teams and so that was part of a team guideline um, about all, how many would do. The sport and the coach, how he wants or she that, wants to run. That is correct. And they did that together, um, you know, in conjunction with Keith and with talking with people. But that was a team guideline. It wasn't a triple C league guideline or something. It was something that worked for the Cape Elizabeth Middle School. And a lot of it has to do with facility too. And I think it would be difficult to, to form a lot of teams um, we just don't have the facilities for, for practice time. Right, and, and so far we've been able to, um, by doing some things creatively, and what works in one sport, we may solve it a different way in another sport, um, all with the idea of getting students some quality um, playing time and opportunity to improve their skills. 
Thank you, Nancy. Uh, I do have a comment on that, though, uh, and maybe this isn't the place, but having served on the um, Casco Bay Soccer Board and having heard Bob Bigelow's presentation recently, I would like to, and if it's appropriate, have something in the middle school section which speaks to kids are not chosen to be on teams based on ability or skills. That I, I think if 20 kids come out, you don't pick your 16 best on the team. You might rotate positions on the team, but, um, but I really think that middle school athletics should be about everybody having an equal opportunity to develop. And I would rather see that we... Rather than have like a, an A team and a B team? That's a change of philosophy, which is different than what this is, this is saying. So this would not be the time or the... It no. says cuts aren't made, but... Cuts aren't made, but that's a, that's a whole different issue than what's addressed here. Okay, and that, so there'll be another place to... It could be, but I, it's not addressed in here at all. Okay. Is it addressed somewhere else at this point? Well, right now, for instance, in some sports, for in basketball, we have two different teams. It, it's the idea, and, and I'm a person who's always spoken very strongly about middle school as an opportunity to play mm -hmm. and really pushing that, and I passionately believe that. But also, sometimes our philosophies work better in some sports than others. Mm -hmm. In soccer, that kind of philosophy works very well for us and for our students. And that's why having those three teams, nobody's an expansion team. We rotate. We can take so many players and realistically get them into the game. It's not fun to ride the bus and just sit there and not get into the game because we happen to have 40 kids on a team. So that has worked out really well in soccer. One place, Susan, where it doesn't work out as well is into the game of basketball. Because if we have some students who are really far ahead of others in skills, and we go to play another team, and we're rotating all of our students, some of our students who this may be their first time playing basketball, and we play with a team, and that other team is beating us 40 to 2. It's a very long game. If you watch our expansion basketball teams, um, I would offer that those are some of our best teams to watch because the students are so excited when they get a basket, they're even more excited when they get it in the right basket. But they understand that with each other. They don't expect, they know they haven't been playing basketball since they were two. And it's okay because it is truly the most important thing, first and foremost, can you get it in the basket? And then do we remember where we're going? And it, they play on a whole different level. It's like I've had students say to me, you know, is that in that B team? That's the best team. So I think it is not here addressed at all. It's a philosophy kind of thing. We can certainly discuss that throughout the middle school and bring it up. But just from my venue, I know, <coughs> something I would passionately believe in mm -hmm. and be with you on. But I do know, in operation, it works in some sports better than others. Part of that problem is the rest of the league fun functions on an expansion league concept. So if we didn't go along with that, then we'll we just wouldn't fit. Okay. Moving on. Um, policy uh, JJIA uh, puts into policy the Athletic Steering Committee. This is a group that has been in existence. Um, what this does is creates a policy so that um, people are clear about what, that role, what the role of that group is and talks a little bit about when they're supposed to meet and what, for instance, an annual meeting on budget and another one at the end of the school year. So it creates that group in policy form. Is this, um, is this new? Uh, this is a new policy. All these are, we, all these are new policies. Okay, so there, we there wasn't this, anything about- There wasn't anything that said we had this group. Okay, I'm surprised. Um, also, we've had um, rules about sanctioning of sports. Um, again, nothing in policy form. Uh, this gives us something that we can put our hands on. So if someone comes to us asking about how do I create a new sport, right. um, these are the steps, this is the process um, so that everyone's clear about how a sport gets sanctioned. Policy JJIG. Um, yeah. Tom, before we go to JJIG, mm -hmm. just quickly, at some point in time, I, for one, would love to see a, a matrix or something that shows us the sport and tells us whether it's club school or school sponsored. We have that in the athletic Yeah, book. and with uh, th the specific on that particular sport and that particular level, what exactly is and isn't being paid for. Because I'm still, I get a little, I, I've read through this 
now makes the sixth time, and I'm still not entirely clear on what's being paid for and what's not being paid for. Mm -hmm. And of course, in my case, that might help me uh, understand the, the fundraising side of it a little better. Keith has already prepared that, Kevin, so we can provide that for you. Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, policy JJIG is evaluation of coaches. This also puts into policy form the process, um, who's responsible for evaluating who and what that process should look like. I tried to keep it simple. Um, obviously, there are a number of coaches. Uh, it can be a very time-consuming task, but, but we did want to create something that was doable and um, takes place um, each year for our head coaches, assistant coaches, at both the junior varsity, freshman, and middle school level. Will we be developing a common instrument? Yes. Mm -hmm. The file DFAB, uh, the Athletic Booster Organizations. This policy was created to define uh, what an athletic booster organization is, what their role is. Um, it also puts together an athletic booster organization coordinating committee um, that will, that is an attempt to bring those booster organizations together so that there are some common guidelines. What the role of that committee and also as far as finances that there would be an annual statement of revenues and expenditures. Out of this, there is also a recommendation um, that actually Susan spoke to when she talked about sabbaticals that we will be creating next year an athletic booster handbook. Um, Andy Stroud is part of this sabbatical. We'll be working with Keith Weatherby to create that. Uh, file DFD-R. This has to do with uh, gate receipts and admissions. There was some con has been some confusion as to who can uh, charge admission for games and where that money goes. This clears all of that up. Um, and if there is um, any, um, any gate receipts, what, what happens to those monies and which groups can do that? Uh, the other piece on, on athletic fundraising um, talks about the, not only the gate receipts and ticket sales, but the affiliation that these groups have with the school districts and what has to happen to those funds. Because of this policy, DFDR, the policy that was created not too long ago, the fundraising administrative procedures was a little out of whack with the newly created policy. So the one change um, in this is on the second page of DF-R, that used to say um, the athletic booster groups needed approval of the athletic administrator. Um, in the new policy about athletic fundraising, we're requiring both the principal and the athletic administrator to approve just to help with communication. Oftentimes the principal may be aware of an extracurricular group that's getting involved with some fundraising. And if the principal isn't aware of the athletic booster groups, then they could be in conflict. So we changed this to agree with what's on the policy that I just reviewed. <coughs> lastly, another policy, um, the first page of this is almost verbatim from the law. What we're requ required to do uh, regarding directory information um, what, and what that means, and then uh, guidelines as far as access to employee records and then employee rec access.